What's up, everybody? We're back at it today, and we're talking about a new case that we haven't broken down yet at all on the channel. So we're going to give a little bit of an overview, explain kind of what the accusations are, and then dive into a couple of the very interesting legal angles of the trial, which come down to two very difficult questions for the jury that they have to answer if they are holding each side to their proper burdens, although it seems like the evidence overwhelmingly points in one direction. There could be some reasons for that. So we'll talk about that today and more, and we'll see if you guys actually enjoy this um, content about the Border Patrol um, multiple murder serial killer type of a case, which literally to me reminds me of an episode of SVU. I swear there was an S, uh, VO, SVU episode just like this where some law enforcement officer or someone was cleaning up the streets, going after prostitutes, drug addicts, things like that. So I swear there this already happened in a movie, but no. Unfortunately, this is real life um, today, and this trial is happening right now in Texas v. Ortiz. So if you're interested in this content, if you enjoy this type of breakdown of the trial, I know it's still going on right now and some people are are still watching that trial. I've caught a lot of it um, and gone through some of the really important highlights that I want to talk about and then answer some of your questions during today's video. So we'll get to all that and more. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already and you enjoy these kinds of breakdowns and like this video specifically if you like the content about this case. So the Border Patrol case generally is that some women of the night were coming up dead in Texas, I believe uh, four altogether, until one day another uh, known prostitute was found running topless towards a law enforcement officer and said she thinks she's with the guy that's killing all of these prostitutes. And it turns out to be a border patrol agent supervisor who's in the intelligence branch um, of border patrol. And he gets arrested and eventually con uh, confesses in an interrogation. And then they connect a ton of evidence to him with ballistics, bullets, guns, um, his statements, uh, video recordings from different areas. And of course, the testimony of the victim that got away, uh, whose name is Miss Pena. He then later says that the confession was coerced. It isn't him. He pleads not guilty. So that's how we get to trial in a case like this with seemingly overwhelming evidence like a confession coming in against the defendant. So when we have a case like this, the interesting uh, legal questions that present themselves and really what I want to ask you all about, what's going to be very important, this, this video is going to be centered around you, the people that are potential jurors in whatever jurisdiction it is that you live. Because we've tried cases with similar issues, not the same fact scenario, obviously, because this is very unusual, but the, the major questions that come up in this case come up in a lot of cases. And we're going to focus around two main questions that I want you all to answer with how you're watching this case. And then just generally how you think about um, these situations. We're going to go over what the opening statements are and some of the important witnesses in the case. But generally speaking, the two big ticket items in this case that I want to discuss with you. And I really want to get your input in the chat and in the comments, if you're watching this later, how do you feel about difficult witnesses or unsympathetic or less than perfect victims? We heard a little bit about this in the Deb V. Heard case, but these victims are less than perfect by societal standards, right? They are known prostitutes, criminals, drug addicts, the prosecution says it, the defense says it, um, it's admitted on the stand. So when we take that into account, I think a lot of us can understand, you know, people make mistakes or they get in these situations that are outside of their control and we shouldn't hold it against them. We shouldn't condemn them. But when you're comparing testimony, it is important to try and determine who is telling the truth and who is lying, who may have had, um, may have been under the influence at the time something happened and how reliable would their testimony be versus somebody who was sober. And in this case, the defense is trying to paint the prostitute, drug addict, criminal victims against the decorated military law enforcement border control officer with a perfectly clean record. 
a lot of us have heard about the case and a lot of us have heard other things, but if you're just coming into it and you don't know anything else about it and he's going to deny this and the main witness against him is going to be somebody with that kind of a background, could I use the term sex worker? Okay, yes, I could use the term sex worker. They use the terms prostitute, so that's why I used it. I was just using, using the verbiage they used in court. Um, but if sex worker is more appropriate, I can try to do that. I always do my best, but I really want to try to keep it to what's happening in the courtroom. And these are the words they're using in the courtroom. Addicted to drugs, criminal record, convicted felons. So when you have this situation, and I hear people saying I'm with the victims, of course. I'm just saying, legally speaking, when lawyers are, are making these kinds of, of arguments, what do you think as a juror? Do you hold that against them? Do you think that their testimony is less reliable? And this is a really important for me because I would love to hear what you guys say. Because sometimes we have imperfect clients who have struggled with drugs in the past or who have been convicted of a crime, but then they got their arm broken because somebody screwed up or because somebody was drunk driving and T-boned them. And the defense attorneys will try to make our client look like a bad person because they have been arrested for possession of crack cocaine in the past. So I want to know how you potential jurors would hold that against them. And that's why I'm asking these questions because I learn a lot in these conversations and that's what makes this really interesting to me in a case like this, um, really interesting, right? Because bad things still happen to people that are struggling and bad things still happen to people that are not in the best situations or maybe not the best, they haven't made the best decisions throughout their life or like I said, outside of their control, they end up at a certain point. Bad things can still happen to those people even if they're not doing anything wrong or even if they don't deserve it, I should say, um, regardless of what we think about the position they find themselves in. So that's question number one. Question number two, a lot of people are asking, we have a confession, so why does it even matter? The confession in this case was, I believe, eight or nine hours starting at two or three a.m., talking to somebody who said they had blackouts, suffer from PTSD, anxiety, or medicated, have been treating for this. And he denied it for hours and hours and hours and then eventually confessed. So the defense is arguing coercion versus confession. And that's the second major legal angle is, you know, dealing with the imperfect victims in the case versus a decorated defendant. And then you have confession versus coercion. And I've watched the confession and we'll talk about that. So those are the two main questions. And I want to know how you guys think of a confession. If somebody says it, I mean, do you think it's like 99% that if they say it, they did it? What does it take for you to think a confession is coerced? Does it take a mental incapacity or mental deficiency for the defendant? Like we saw in making a murder in that documentary. Do they have to be a minor? Do they not have to understand the process? Do you hold a law enforcement officer like Mr. Ortiz in a different standard because he knows how this stuff works? Does the mental deficiencies that he says he has, whether we believe him or not, does that make you think maybe it was coerced? To me, some of the factors in this case that make it seem more coerced is the timing, how he was you know, looking beforehand pretty rough, and then some of the things the law enforcement officer said I didn't like. I really didn't like. And we can get into more of that later if you guys want to continue talking about this. But some of the things on the other side that make me think it was an absolutely legitimate confession is that while they said he was repeating what he could have heard in the news, he gave way more detail than anything that was reported, number one. Number two, he also explained in detail what was going through his head, which was also never in the news. He gave a perfect motive that, make per that made perfect sense, which was that he was cleaning up the streets. These bad people that didn't deserve to live, basically, and nobody was doing anything about it. So, so, many, so much evidence in this case is being used by both sides, which always is interesting. The same piece of evidence, the prosecution has it as a smoking gun and the defense has it as a smoking gun and the confession is one of those things. But the bad background of the victims is also something the prosecution, because of what Mr. Ortiz said, his own words once again, in the interrogation, because he gave them the I'm cleaning up the streets motive, it's almost like the prosecution wants to prove that all of the victims were 
uh, sex workers, drug addicts, and uh, convicted criminals. Because to prove they are is right in lockstep with his motive, right in lockstep with a law enforcement officer taking the law in his own hands and cleaning up these streets. So that's absolutely something the prosecution is going to use to pull to prove uh, motive. But the defense will also use it as they are unreliable. Their memory is foggy because of the drugs. Can you really trust what they say versus this decorated officer? So it's very, very, very interesting to hear this type of evidence that both sides are going to use. And hours and hours of this interrogation was played, and I think the defense wanted it all to be in there in the rule of completion, and the judge allowed because they wanted to show how long he was in there, how brutal it was, how much he was laying his head on the table, and they're going to argue coercion, obviously. So let's talk about the opening statements here. I thought the state's opening was great. And I think that most of the jury probably was thinking, I'm convicting this guy after the state's opening. Studies show that most jurors, the majority of jurors, make up their minds after opening statements. And after this opening statement with the mountain of evidence, the legitimate mountain of evidence that we're seeing as the trial goes on, is stacked against Mr. Ortiz. Yes, we have Ms. Pena. We're going to talk about her, the star witness, the victim that got away. Yes, we have the confession. Those are the two main points I'm going to focus on. But we also have ballistics, bullets, guns, the truck, the purses, the condoms, the syringes, the cash, the receipts, what they bought, consistency throughout the evidence. We also have the consistencies and stories of where his wife and kids were. We have how Pena is consistent with what his confession was, is consistent with what they find on the videos outside of the gas stations and the body cam footage from law enforcement officers and how the investigation went. We have motive. And we have their explanation of how this was not coerced and how this investigation was tight and went in one direction. And it went in one direction because Mr. Ortiz is the one that committed these crimes. Then you have the defense opening. And I actually thought it was really interesting. And I thought it was pretty good, um, as good as you can do when there's this much evidence against your client. And instead of saying that evidence doesn't exist, you say there are screw-ups with um, the investigation, jumping to conclusions, chain of custody arguments. Uh, of course, he attacked the victims for their addiction and their profession. Um, we don't know who took these photos. We don't know where this evidence went. We don't know. There was no inventory search. Where was the keys? How did they get in his car? They made the argument an opening statement multiple times that the jury may get an instruction that this was an illegal search. And that piqued my interest. And I'm saying, that's a legal question. How is he arguing this to the jury? It must be different in Texas. Then when he argued it again, the prosecutor objected. And the judge said, you may get a charge that says, you think this was an unfair search. And he was literally making unreasonable search and seizure arguments to the jury. Now, I don't know how much the jury understands that. You all, potential jurors, would probably understand it more than most people because of what you're into and what you learn about and what you listen to on a daily basis. But I don't know if people that are not as educated understand that this is usually a legal question. What do they do with that information if they think this search is unfair? Right? Let's say the search is unfair and it's fruit of the poisonous tree, which would mean they can't use the gun that they found in the car. They can't use the purses, which they are allowed to. They can't use the, the stuff they found inside the purses. All of that's coming in front of the jury, so it's not having that effect that it has in real cases where the judge finds that's, that it's an unreasonable search and seizure. But let's say you're the jury and you understand that, and so you say, okay, in my mind, I'm going to block out all the stuff they found in the truck. Where does that get you? You can still believe Ms. Pena. You can still watch the confession and you can still get there. But one hole poked at a time. I also thought the defense attorney, I mean, a few times he's not even letting the judge rule on objections. He's just like totally dismissing the objection, the objection saying uh, improper things in front of the jury, in my opinion. Um, he's saying 
judge that this is what they're going to say. They're going to say that they didn't have the keys or else I'm going to impeach him because he said it in a prior hearing all in front of the jury, which to me is inappropriate to say the least. Um, but the judge is letting him get away with it. And I, I think the judge is letting is giving both sides a lot of leeway to go through this, um, process together to get this in front of the jury and get as much of the evidence in front of the jury as we can. Talks about how he's a war veteran, how he has blackouts, how he has PTSD, and the issues that he works through on a daily basis, and for the last few years dealing with this, and yet he's never committed a crime. So why now all of a sudden are we thinking he's committing these most heinous of crimes? And then, of course, when he got to the confession, the defense attorney argued that it was coerced. When I thought... Initially, after hearing the state, when he said, well, he knew exactly where this one body is that nobody else knew where it was. Well, the defense in this case seems like they want to have an answer for everything. So they try to even have an answer for that. And their answer is, well, he's a supervisor in an intelligence agency and God knows what he knows. He could know everything and just be spouting it off. Also, he used the God knows again in his uh, opening statement when he said it's a coerced confession. God knows what the VA is giving him. And this is playing on the jury's emotions, which is why I'm asking you these questions. A lot of people out there, we have a lot of veterans in the chat. Some of them love and swear by the VA. Some of them think the going to the VA is a death sentence. So if any of these jurors think that the VA sucks and the defense attorneys are going to say the VA sucks and they over medicated him and he had blackouts, well, then they're going to hit with those jurors. Same thing. Some of the jurors may absolutely hate the profession of these victims or hate drugs or had somebody in their family affected by this stuff or love border patrol or whatever. There are some very passionate sides of this case that if a jury comes in with preconceived notions, I think could be very difficult to get over. That's why jury selection in this case was probably very, very contested and important. The VA is the, the veterans hospital. So just a picture for those of you that haven't watched the whole case, I wanted to just give a couple clips to, and again, this is a lot for my edification because I want to know the, the worst possible way you could open up a witness statement. Could you still believe what this person was going to say if this was how they started their witness statement. So let's get to Miss Pena. She is um, the victim that got away. She was in Mr. Ortiz's grasps and he pulled his gun and she ripped away, ran, got a law enforcement officer and kind of started the ball rolling and ended up um, identifying him later. Uh, but let's hear a little bit of what she had to say. And this is how they started off her statement in trial. And you all let me know if you can hear this. You can open it here. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can you please <clears throat> state your full name for the record? Eric Isamar Pena. I'm going to ask you to please uh, speak or get up close to the mic or move the mic close to your mouth. Uh, please listen to my questions. Answer the questions to the best of your ability. Okay. How old are you? 31. And uh, where are you from? Laredo, Texas. How long have you lived in Laredo? Born and raised. Are you married? No. Do you have any children? Yes. How many children do you have? One. Okay, and how old is your child? Twelve. Okay. Does your child live with you? Not right now. Okay. Ms. Peña, do you have a criminal record? Yes, I do. I want to talk a little bit about it. Do you know more or less how many times you've been arrested? Um, several times. Okay. Is it more than five? Yes. More than ten? Yeah. More than fifteen? Not sure. Okay. Um, you ever been arrested for possession of a controlled substance? Yes. Uh, can you tell the ladies and gentlemen what type of controlled substance you've been arrested for? Probably cocaine or heroin. And did at the, any of these cases have they ever resulted in a conviction? Uh, yes. Okay. 
And after you were convicted, have you ever been in prison? No, never. Okay, what type of sentence have you received? I was in probation for two years. Not too long ago, I just finished. Are you currently under any type of supervision or probation right now? No, I'm done with everything. Okay. What, uh, you ever been arrested for assaulting a police officer, resisting arrest? Or terrorism? Yes. Yeah. What about uh, resisting arrest? Yes. What about terroristic threats? Yes. Uh, terroristic threats. And that's one I didn't even mention. And that's pretty bad, terroristic threats. Now, what I would say is most of this can be explained away by drug addiction. Um, most of this is a result of that, which is why it's so sad and maybe a discussion for another day. But I mean, that's about as bad of a resume. I mean, you hear them start expert witnesses with all their credentials and education and experience. This is like the exact opposite of that, right? I mean, this is about as bad of a resume as you can have before you're about to testify under oath to something so important. But I think she came off pretty believable and her statement's pretty consistent with other statements. It's pretty consistent with the videos we've seen in the case. It's even consistent with Mr. Ortiz's confession eventually when he makes it. So to me, someone that comes off as a good witness that's consistent in what they say with other um, evidence, can you look past one of the worst resumes we've seen? I'm not saying drugs excuse that away. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying her main offense is drug addiction. That, that's what I say. I think it stems a lot from drug addiction. Um, some people's stro uh, uh, main offense is violence and everything comes from the violence um, or the anger or whatever. But again, and it's okay if you guys don't. If you're saying like, I don't believe what she says because of this, honesty is important in the chat and we're all gonna be um, respectful of that, but it helps us learn that there are some people that are just going to say, I don't believe what she's going to say. What about any violent offenses? You ever been? Yeah. Okay. Do you suffer from any type of addiction? Ms. Pena? No, not right now. Have you before? Yes. And what type of addiction is that? Heroin and crack. Okay. Can you tell us or tell the jury? Um, well, let me ask you, are you sober right now? I take methadone. How long have you been on methadone? I've been in the methadone. So this is an interesting conversation too that we'll bring up later again on cross that I have had witnesses in cases when I was a prosecutor that um, were taking methadone and the effects of methadone and what it is. How many of you in the chat know what methadone is and how it affects people? Because it's an interesting conversation that there's not always an agreement on, but so we'll continue. A year, almost a year. And where do you get that, uh, that methadone? Mm, by my person. Do you receive services? Yes. Okay. Uh, when was the last time you were arrested? If you recall. Probably like six or five months ago. Probably six months. Was that a misdemeanor or a felony? Um, revoked for probation. Oh, okay, so you were revoked for not, yeah. uh, not complying with your condition. Yeah. Okay. And what does that entail? More drug use? Or you came out dirty? No. I, I mean, this is way post incident and arrest. And only a few months ago, she was arrested again for violating probation. So again, she's not even sitting up there today saying I'm perfect now or I'm all good now, right? Seems honest to me. But again, I think there are some, I, whether people admit it in the chat or not, I think there are some jurors that would hold it against her and it would be tough for them to believe her, which is always something lawyers fear when they put a witness like this up on the stand. I, I just didn't go, uh, I just didn't go on report. Okay. How long have you been dealing with this issue of substance abuse or how long have you abused heroin, crack cocaine? I started when I was uh, 21, on and off. And you're 31 right now? I'm 31. So is it fair to say that for 10 years you've been dealing with this yes. issue? And how were you able to support this addiction? Um, many ways. Um, working in the streets, that was one. Um, no, it's OK, Ms. Peña. Um, I know this may be difficult, but uh, when you say working the streets, what please tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what that means. Escorting. Escorting? Yes. And when you say escorting, what does that mean? Um, working for money. And when you say working for money. Having sex. For money. For money, yes. Okay. And how long have you been doing that? Um, on and off. Six years. You started in your early 20s? I started when I was 23. 
now on September the 14th of 2018. Yes. That was a few years ago now, right? Yes. Were you working? At All right. So that's the basic introduction to Miss Pena, who's the, the victim that got away in this case. And one of the inconsistencies that um, the defense brings up is her explanation of how he pulled the gun um, on her when she was in his truck right before she got away, what made her scared. Uh, so let's listen to her explain that. You show the ladies and gentlemen jury where he pointed to you. Right here at my face. Right at your, hold up your hand and, and show us how. Just like this. With his left arm. With his left arm. Yeah. He put the gun next to your face. Yeah. What else, if anything, did he do? while he's pointing the gun with his right arm trying to hold me but I'm not getting off okay so she says and she you know reiterates that I remember it specifically he holds the gun up to my face he holds it with his left hand later on cross they'll try to impeach her with that but what's interesting to me is that was one of the only points that they really impeached her as an inconsistent statement when we have other statements video evidence recordings of her statements and what happened to her that night and throughout. To me, that's pretty good. Now, it's an important, it's definitely an important part of the puzzle. So to get that wrong, you know, maybe you can can get into that. Um, but I did want to hit a couple points on Cross because the defense's job is to, if they don't think that she's a reliable witness, to explain to the jury why they don't think she's a reliable witness. So let's get into a little bit of that. And this is going to be them discussing... Uh, the effects of methadone. A lot of you are saying, and I agree with you, that it's something you get on to help uh, uh, stop the cravings of meth and help you stay off the drugs. And a lot of um, recovering addicts are using it to try to stay off of it. But I have had experts say that it actually can affect you and give you a high and can affect your memory and can affect your um, recall. And the defense kind of tries to get into that here. It was a little clunky, but let me know what you think about it as we listen. This didn't cross my mind to use... <clears throat> Um, well, the idea is, and I'm asking you. Hold on. Okay. Yeah. And so it, I know what methadone is. Okay. Sorry, I was a little late on um, it. I was high, but I know what, what what's going on. Mm -hmm. Well, I was, but, you know, but regardless, you use both of them. Yeah. Okay, correct. Um, now, you know, I mean, as compared to a guy that drinks every day or something like that, he's going to be hung over and he's going to be not feeling the greatest. I'm assuming that doing crack and heroin in those amounts is not the best thing for your body or your mental health. Of course not. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, back on September the 14th of 2018, uh, you, according to you and Mr. Ortiz, and uh, you're the one that inquired about, had you heard about the murders of Melissa? Yeah, when he picked me up. Uh, but Ortiz didn't bring it up. No, I brought it up. Okay. And uh, even though you were frightened uh, at, at either- at Not murder, at that time. Okay. At some point when you said he started acting differently, let's say, or you played- you his, when we got to his house, uh -huh. yeah, okay. that was the first time he had ever acted off. Okay. Other than that, very normal. Okay, but at that time, you were still getting high regularly. Yeah, but to the point where I know what's going on. Um, I was high, but I know what, what what's going on. Mm -hmm. Well, I assume every person that, that uses mind-altering drugs yeah. claim that, right? A guy yeah. that drinks a 12-pack, he's going to go, hey, I know what's going on. Yeah, I know what's right? going on. I'm alert. I'm still alert. Uh -huh. I'm sure you will. Yeah. Okay. Now, um... so he's obviously being sarcastic with her, but she's not really picking it up. Um, but he's being sarcastic, saying mind altering drugs. I'm sure everybody thinks they're alert when they're on mind altering drugs. You testify that um, you still shot at the heroin, though. That, 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 that at his house. Yeah. Yeah. Because, because you were there between six and nine, and you said, you know, you drove around for a while drinking the beer. And then uh, shooting the heroin. I shot up the heroin when, when we got um, to his house. Okay. Yeah. Now, and again, I'm not trying to be offensive. No, it's okay. Are, are you high right now? Somewhat high? No. Are you under? The, you're not here totally clear headed, are you? Yes, I am. Are you under the effects of methadone? Yes. Okay. I take methadone. methadone. I'm sorry. Yes, I do. I and, mean, I'm on methadone. Okay. And methadone, in essence, is a synthetic heroin, correct? Method, methadone is just a. Uh, it's to block uh, any triggers. Well, no, what it is actually is a synthetic heroin 
that is utilized to avoid. Well, argumentative with, with urgency. Not, that's not, this is not relevant question. Well, well, I mean, well, argumentative let, with let, let me address it this way. Uh, ask a question because you're, you're giving testimony instead of asking a question. You're, you're explaining what that is, that you're not a witness in the same. So it's question. been asked and answered, Your Honor, uh, that issue is Re toxic. Refresh question. Drugs. Okay. Are you aware that methadone is a synthetic heroin? No, it's not a synthetic heroin. Okay. Yeah, I would object to that too because he is testifying. An expert has not said that. He could be tricking the witness. He could ask her if she knows what it is, but now he's testifying that it's a synthetic heroin. He would not be allowed to argue that later in closing because no expert to this point in the trial has testified to that, although there are experts that would testify to something like that. Not specifically, but, but something like that. Are you aware that it's utilized to regulate the effects on the human body of people that are on the heroin? That have been on heroin throughout the years. Yes. It's to keep them sober. Okay. Yeah. And so it, I know what methadone is. Okay. And so, well, let me ask you this. What effect does it have on your methadone? As Nothing. opposed to not taking it? Um, it's just. So, I, I mean, I think she won that battle personally. But, again, a lot of you in the chat said you didn't know what it was. So, if any juror doesn't know what it is and they see that, you know, this person has been on drugs in the past and this lawyer is basically saying she's on drugs now, can we really believe what she's saying? These are the questions I'm wondering. When these attacks get hurled at a witness that admittedly has some of these struggles, how do you as a potential juror look at it? And a lot of you are giving me great answers in the chat. So I appreciate that. And I'm reading through them. I'm not going to obviously put every single one of them up on the screen, but I appreciate it. And this is what I want to know. This is what makes this collaborative and interactive because they are hammering home at this stuff. Um, he also improperly impeaches her and other witnesses all the time, kind of like Daryl Brooks did by just like reading their statements, but not a lot of objections. And the judge is kind of letting him do it. Um, let's listen to a little bit of one right here. Now, when, when you asked, according to you, Mr. Ortiz, he has seen the news about the murder uh, or, or that, that he uh, had he heard about it. His response that he said he just saw it in the news. That was I mentioned it and he said, hey, that he had found out through the news. OK. Yeah. And <clears throat> according to you, he starts acting differently or whatever. Weird, according to you. And you testified that, uh, that you heard a voice. You actually heard a voice. And see, he's reading from a prior statement of her. I think this is a good argument by him that, you know, again, he's trying to pick the jurors that are going to think she's a certain way. And if she's hearing voices, maybe they're not going to, you know, believe her. But let's hear how she explains it. What I meant by that is my inner voice, my intuition. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I get that people have their feelings, okay? Yeah. But <clears throat> you testify, I heard a voice. And I actually just said, what? For me to get out fast. Okay. Do you remember testifying yeah. that? Okay. Improper impeachment. Completely improper. But everybody's letting him go. So. Let me just find this. Okay. okay. And then at some point, and I think this is me questioning you now. And you testified that you heard a voice. And just tell me if you recall saying this. Yes, I did. Uh, question. And that this voice told you get out of there, or what did the voice tell you specifically? Just Answer, to get out, get out of the house. Just to get out, yeah. And I think I asked you. And did you hear the voice in English or in Spanish? Did, did it, you hear the voice in English and Spanish? It's, Excuse me, your answer was Spanish. Do you remember testifying to that? It's not. I remember if I said English or Spanish, but um... okay. And then uh, you were asked question: Was it a female Spanish voice or a male? Yeah, voice? I said. And you testified it was a male. Yeah, voice. my ex. I actually thought this was a good impeachment by him because she was trying to say it was a, you know, an internal voice, but clearly before she said it was an audible, I think male voice. I don't remember English or Spanish. So I actually thought that was a good impeachment by him. Um, and then he continues on and, and gets another point later that we'll get to, but it, it was really interesting to me um, how he did impeach her on this and shows that she was trying to make herself sound a certain way with this. You know, I heard an inner voice, but not. Uh, but the state's first question on their redirect, I thought was really good too. Um, but let me let me get to how, where he also, and again, I don't think she's putting on a lot. I think she's just answering honestly. And when you're battling like this with a lawyer, the lawyer is going to come out ahead and, and score some points for sure. Uh, let's hear let's hear this part real quick. Do you want to rephrase questions? Well, have you ever been convicted for criminal acts of violence? Violence? Mm. Well, let me ask you I had probation for aggravated assault. Would you think that that's a violent offense? Or do you think it's a peaceful offense? Mm, it was, 
it was not physical. It was something I said. Okay. Aggravated assault or something you said. Aggravated assault or something I said. Yeah. Okay. And is this the assault on a peace officer? On a no. Officer? This was a family violence. Okay. But on April the 30th of 2019, do you not have one for assault on a peace officer? I don't recall. So, so you're telling me that you've been arrested and you don't recall what charges you've been arrested for? I've been in and out, um, but that I had a warrant for, for what? To me, this has no effect. She's already ad admitted this, um, but there was a part I wanted to get to. I don't know if it, we're going to get here. But... A peace officer. No. Do you know what a peace officer is? A cop. A cop, yes. And so no. according to this, you assaulted a police officer on April the 30th of 2019. Do you have any recollection of that? I don't recall. Because you were high? Maybe. Probably. Yeah, I don't recall. Does it affect the, the drugs affect your memory? Your ability to remember things accurately? Maybe that's why? A little bit. I don't recall that. Or a lot. It's been a long time. 2019 is after 2018. You realize that, right? Well, I don't recall. A lot of things have, have, have happened. It's a lot to take in. I'll pass it with this one. So I don't know if I, I was kind of going in and out there, but he also asked her, drugs affect your memory, right? And she says yes. But let's hear the state's first question on redirect, which I think was really helpful. You say it's a lot to take in. What After... After this happened to you, yeah, how did it affect you? I got diagnosed with PTSD, severe anxiety, and um, depression. So how did all this affect you? I was diagnosed with anxiety, PTSD, depression, all because of this. To me, that is a great first answer to understand why this really affected her. This was not just, you know, drugs or memory issues, but there are all sorts of issues that are combined in this. Um, and I want to take a couple quick snippets to the defense really focused on bad investigation, jumping to conclusions, stepping on his rights with, you know, coercive uh, behavior in the uh, interview and um, unlawful search and seizure. And then also the way they read him as Miranda rights, which I thought was interesting. So I wanted to kind of see where that was in the trial. Um, and they found the officer who wanted to read him the Miranda rights at the scene, but then was told not to, which is interesting and unusual and strategic, not illegal. But if you're trying to convince the jury, they tricked their way into getting this confession, coerced their way. This is an interesting point that doesn't happen in a lot of cases. So let's hear what that officer says about um, wanting to read uh, the defendant his Miranda rights and a supervisor actually telling him not to. Uh, at some point, you began to read him his Miranda rights. Is that correct? I asked uh, one of the supervisors who we were going to read him his rights. No, I thought you started to read him. No. No, I just asked uh, one of the supervisors if we're going to read his Miranda rights, and they advised me uh, to stand by. And who, who stopped you from doing it? That was, uh, at the time, Sergeant Felix Nunez. Sergeant who? Felix Nunez. Nunez. So his supervisor stopped him from reading Miranda rights, which is really interesting and kind of falls in line with the defendant's arguments in this case. So the next major point and days of testimony, because I think the interrogation was like nine hours is his interrogation at the police station. We don't have time to go through the entire interrogation, but what I am going to say, because this is our first episode on this trial, if you guys are interested in this case, hit the like button on this video. And if this video gets to, let's say 3000 likes, then we will do another video breaking down his interrogation, pulling little pieces out of it, to see what we can pull and use as prosecutors or defense attorneys in a trial like this. But something interesting happened before they even got to the interrogation in this case. And that is the judge read a jury instruction and the jury instruction was to tell the jurors that they're about to hear some hearsay. And what I want to know from you all again is Would you understand what this judge is saying? What do you think this judge is saying in this jury instruction? So I'm, I'm going to play it for you, and then we'll talk about it a little bit.
by officers, and you are not. The statements made by the officers are not being offered uh, for the truth of the matter asserted by the officers. Uh, it's being. Uh, All right, here we go. During, you, during the video, you're going to be hearing statements made by officers, and you are not. The statements made by the officers are not being offered uh, for the truth of the matter asserted by the officers. Uh, it's being um, it should be considered only to put in context what the defendant's statement is. The statements are during the interview, and. Um, so uh, the jury's to focus on the defendant's statement uh, being made during the interview. At the All right. So that is a special instruction that lawyers will ask judges to read in certain situations. And in this situation, the judge agreed and read that you're about to watch this interrogation video for hours and hours and hours. The, the police officer statements are not for the truth. You don't have to believe what the police officers say. The defendant's statements are offered for the truth. Very interesting to me. That is very interesting to me. And I think, well, I repeated what it said if somebody didn't understand. Um, it's very interesting to me because you're going to let all these statements by officers come in for the context of an interview, which is appropriate. But these officers say so many things. They say, we know you did that. We found evidence that you did this. We know you were here. We know this was in your house. We know this was in your car. Help us out. Tell us this. Tell us the truth. Connect the dots. Why'd you do it? I don't think it was spur of the moment. I'm sorry. I don't think it was planned. I don't think you planned to do all this. I think it was more spur of the moment. So the jury's hearing all of this, connecting all the dots, walking down the path the officers want them to walk down in this interrogation. They're hearing all of it as part of the presentation of evidence, but they're not supposed to take it as evidence. It's a very difficult thing to do. As confusing as it may be to explain, I promise you it is easier said than done. And it's not very easy to say. So just imagine how difficult it is to actually do. Very interesting. And then they get to the interrogation, which is long and brutal. And they definitely pull at his, they, they don't only tug at his heartstrings, but they're also tugging on the heartstrings of the jury. So much so that the prosecutor uses what, the, the officers say in this interrogation in their opening statements, these victims are sisters and daughters and mothers and friends. That's literally what they say in the interrogation. You know, these people are daughters and friends and they're people too. They're mothers. They have mothers. And the jury's hearing all this from the prosecutor, from the detectives in this interrogation. And to me, reiterating this stuff is very bad for the defense. Now, again, there's plenty for the defense to use. They say, come on, help us out. We'll hook your wife up. We'll make sure she's okay. Now's your chance to help your wife. You know, just tell us this. Tell us what you did. Tell us why you did it. There is some coercive behavior in there. I'm not sure anything that really um, crosses a line, but some things, if that's what you're going with, that you would have to argue as a defense attorney. He denied, denied, denies, denies, denies for hours and said he didn't do anything. They keep saying, help us out. Help your family out. Now, he does lie about, you know, using sex workers and then later admits to using sex workers and things like that. So they're, the jury's already going to understand this guy is probably a pathological liar. He's going to say what he needs to say to, you know, try to keep himself uh, free. And then at the end of the interrogation, he absolutely does, you know, crack or whatever you want to call it and admits to the crimes they know about and even some of the crimes they don't know about where a body is that nobody even knew about. But the defense's argument is that, you know, he knows things because he's in intelligence. Then we've seen a lot of evidence and pictures and videos and other testimony of law enforcement officers, again, that I think all is very consistent with everything Erica said and also consistent with this interrogation. We saw pictures that the gun was exactly where he said it was in his truck. He admitted that it was his truck. He admitted he had all these other guns at the house. Um, he lived right where Erica knew that he lived. Um, the officer said Erica came up. We saw the body cam where she wasn't wearing a shirt where he had ripped off her shirt. We saw all of that. We've seen a lot of evidence so far. We've seen some casings, where they found it. The defense has made some chain of custody objections. The defense has made some objections that the officer didn't see this actual disc, which again is not a bad argument, but all they have to do to fix that and the judge is going to let them is let's put the disc in, have the officer watch it. Now the officer can testify that this is a fair and accurate depiction of what he provided to the state attorney's office. 
So the defense, I think, has gotten some good shots in. I hear a lot of you saying you don't like the defense attorneys. That's very common. People don't like defense attorneys for the most part. They really don't, um, especially in heinous cases like this. But I don't think they're doing a bad job, honestly. I think they're fighting good fights. I think they're picking good battles, um, objecting to certain pieces of evidence, and they have legitimate arguments as to whether or not something's an objection to hearsay, like are all of her statements an excited utterance? What about when the cop starts asking her statements or questions? I agree with the defense. I don't think all of that should have come in, and it did. Is it big enough to be an appellate issue? Probably not, because the excited utterance uh, that they even agreed should come in, most of that is what is going to convict uh, Mr. Ortiz. I think the evidence is overwhelming against Mr. Ortiz. I think these crimes are so heinous, and I think the motive all makes sense that I don't think it's going to be a far jump for the jury to convict him. But I think there are some legitimate appellate issues and some interesting legal angles, which is all it takes really for us to discuss this. And uh, Christy asked, were you following this case before you requested it? No, not at all. I wasn't following it at all, not one bit. But enough of you asked me to, to break it down. So I want to do at least one video on it, just kind of give my thoughts and see where we're at. If you guys want more, you know how to find me and let me know. And we may talk about it more at Tragos Law here on Instagram and Twitter. Give me a follow on there if you haven't already. Uh, Michael Clark, yo, first live, love the content. Any plans to discuss the new Casey Anthony documentary? I've had some requests from friends, um, like in my life, to do this. I haven't had the time to watch it yet, and I actually didn't watch every second of the Casey Anthony trial, so there'd be some gaps for me to have to fill in as well, so we'll see. Kayla Pierce, he's not an expert. It's unacceptable for him to explain it the way he's trying to, to is it? It is unacceptable the first way he did it. The second way to ask it as a form of a question is appropriate, but it's not facts and evidence because nobody testified to it, so he can't use it in argument later. Cat, Peter, if they're under the influence, can the judge negate their testimony? They can. The judge can not allow them to testify if they want to based on being under the influence, or they can argue to the jury. As we talk about, there's a jury instruction in every case. Can you believe the credibility of the witnesses? And you can take into account whether they're on medication, on methadone, um, if they feel like they have an accurate represent or, uh, uh, recollection of the events, that can be something that the defense attorneys can argue to the jury. John O'Rourke, is it popular lawyering technique to just read off statements like that, like Brooks did? No, because it's in, it's improper. And I, I should say, and everywhere I've ever practiced and every courtroom I've ever been in, it's improper to just read prior statements. What you have to say is, um, I'm trying to remember where it was that, that he used that. What did he impeach her with now? Oh, um, so once he got her to say that, yes, it was kind of an internal voice. It was an intuition. It was a gut feeling, I think is what he said first. As soon as she said that, now he can try to impeach her and say, well, no, you said it was an audible voice, didn't you? And if she says no, then you say, well, do you remember giving the statement? I was there. Uh, the prosecutors were there. Court reporter was taking everything down. It was under oath. He even said in this trial, well, were you lying then or are you lying now? which a lot of people like to think that they would ask, but most judges won't allow it. Uh, most judges, if the state objects, they won't allow you to say, are you lying to badger the witness? But you can ask something like, well, which is true? That or this? Because you'd agree those aren't the same statements. And then later in closing, you can argue that they lied. Um, but they don't want you to kind of harass or badger the witness on the stand with that type of stuff. Uh, so yes, it would make it a lot easier if we could just do it that way. And sometimes we have done it that way and some judges allow it. But if a judge doesn't allow it, you have to do it the proper way where you ask the question first, get the answer, then impeach them with their inconsistent answer that they've given in a prior sworn statement. All right, we are coming uh, close to the end here. Somebody just sent me on Twitter that Amber Heard has filed an answer brief to Johnny Depp's brief. So I'm sure that's something else we'll be hitting later. But if you have content, you want us to cover, hit us up with it. December seems like it's going to be a little slow, so we may pop back in on this Border Patrol case. I'm sure we'll do more uh, depth be heard, but let me know what you have. And of course, Monday, Wednesday, Friday mornings, Be A Lawyers will come out. You guys are starting to enjoy those. Um, when you watch those, hit that like button so that other people can kind of get out on the algorithm and other people that might enjoy those shorts a little um, fun and not as serious and depressing as some of these topics we hit. Um Melanie missed being able to catch a live. You're the best Utrid. Thank you, Melanie. I can't wait for that uh, movie to come out. P hop 444 new to this case. Did he confess then say he didn't do it and then confess again? I don't know if he confessed again after now saying he didn't do it, but he confessed in the interrogation for sure. Um, and then came out and said he didn't do it. It was a coerced confession, which is very difficult to get over. Um, and I asked in the chat earlier, what would it take 
for you to think it was a coerced confession. A lot of people said the amount of time, uh, mental uh, issues, uh, whether you're a minor or not, um, the questions the cop asked. So I, I really interesting. I, I really am interested in going back and to read all those more in the comments if you guys can leave in what it would take to prove a co confession is coerced. But that's all we got for this video. We'll be back soon with you guys. Hit that like button on the way out and subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks for watching. Until next time.